Welcome to Chat with Nomads, where we uncover travel insights, business advice, adventure stories, and lifestyle tips with world travelers and digital nomads. Here is your host, Rax, from nomadsunveiled.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today, we have Carlos from Spain. And Carlos actually belongs to a small and rare group of people who is in the United Nations master's list of individuals who have been to all 193 countries in the world. Hi, Carlos. Welcome to the show. Hi, Rax. Thank you very much for having me. Why don't you go ahead and give an introduction of yourself so the listeners know your background and a bit of the context. Okay. So my name is Carlos and I was born in Spain in a village called Figueras. Uh, but I've been living most of my life in, in Roses. It's a fisherman village in the northeast part of Spain. Well, it's a very strategic place because we have like the Pyrenees and also we have the Mediterranean seas. We can uh, swim and I can go to ski in the mountains the same day. And also the gastronomy, it's, it's amazing. Uh, Mediterranean gastronomy. Also, we have a very, a very famous bay, the Bay of Roses. It's, this is my area. When I'm traveling after... A few months, I'm always coming back here, feel good with family and friends. Talking about my childhood, I was a very crazy guy, you know, in the school. I was not the best student. I love atlases and geography books. My personality, when I feel a little bit tired, I'm moving to another place. I have to, to do it. Yeah, each cheap excite. Whenever I meet you, you are like always the guy who creates the mood or the ambience within the group. You know, like if you are there, people start talking and everything. I don't know, maybe the class clown that, you know, makes everyone happy and stuff like that. Uh, but by the way, I was looking at some of your photos in your hometown and you are there right now, right? But it's like one of the best place, I would say, because I'm apparently stuck in a city, but I see some of your photos, you basically have the oceans and the mountain and like you have all the nature just like right at your doorstep. Yes, yes, you're right. It's good because, you know, I can just go out, keep walking. And I can go to do the, the, the tour of the bay or can go to the, the national park. It's less than, than half an hour from where I'm living. I'm glad to be here because if I was in another place, uh, normally, you know, uh, you don't have the same, the same freedom, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. And I know you guys are also like near the French borders, right? Are you guys now getting like local tourists or like even tourists coming in from France or are the borders now closed? Yes, yes. We, we are like 45 minutes uh, driving from the border. From where I'm living, it's around 60, 70 kilometers. The French are the most common tourists because we are neighbors. But also we, we receive a lot of uh, tourism from uh, Europe. Many people, you know, from, from Europe because of the sun. And also the place you know, is cheaper than, than their places. Mm. So that's why it's a, it's a very good place to come for the gastronomy and for many, many activities, you know. Yep, and, and it's popular during winter, right? Because I understand now it's winter there, but the temperature isn't like exactly that low, right? You were saying above 10 or something? Right now, the, the winters are so light, you know, they, they are not winters like many, many years ago. For example, I'm, I'm hiking and swimming in, in the Mediterranean Sea every day. <laughs> it's not a, a very cold weather. So you can uh, stay here and, and no problem. Yeah, it sounds like a great place to go like during to escape the winter, right? Especially if you can't fly across continent. I think that's like a great location for Europeans to go like during the winter season. Okay, why don't we start off with like the main question, I guess. I mean, a lot of people have the dream of being able to visit all the countries in the world. And I know it's definitely not like an easy task for sure, but you have been able to complete it, although... You really took your time to do it, but how do you feel immediately after you achieved the feat? Like when you got the last stamp on the on your passport right at that moment, do you feel very accomplished, or do you feel like a sigh of relief, or do you start feeling lost? Like oh no, what am, I've already finished this goal of life. What do I do next? It's a certain relief, you know, big relief. Wow, man, I don't I don't have to go to dangerous country or sometimes the, the situation in in some countries are very dangerous or very difficult and also the bureaucracy so now it's, i don't have to do a, a more paperwork you know so and i don't have to wait because you have to be very patient mm -hmm. for, the, for the visas and all the stuff so right right now when, when i when i finish was like thinking wow man it's done you know uh, at least i finished something in my life i was thinking if i finish this you know it's going to be something amazing you know not many people can can do that you know 
and, and also many people are traveling, but to finish all the countries is, is a matter of time. It's a matter also of trying to be always focused on how, how you can do it. Or sometimes you have to wait because maybe you have the money and the time, but you cannot go there because they don't allow you to go inside the country. So you need to wait, no, basically. And then sometimes are, are tough moments. It's like you are thinking it's better give up and, and do another thing. It's, it's not for everyone. And I was not thinking about finishing all the countries in the world you know, at the beginning. I, I was not born thinking I'm going to finish all the countries. You know, I, I met people that, you know, when, I, when they were a child, you know, they, they were thinking about finishing. You have many different kind of travelers, but for, in my case, for example, it was not a plan, you know, like, uh, I don't want to, because, and also for me, it took me like more than 20 years and other, other people, they do it in one and a half year. It depends about the, if you want to be in a, in a Guinness record, if you are young and you have the energy and you have the money and, and travelers, you know, we are, we are moved because of, of the passion, you know, we are curious, we want to, to see yeah. every place. And maybe after you say, wow, well, I shouldn't go there. Or I was there and I was not, not the thing I was thinking about, you know. For, for me, it was a little bit rough because it was like working during the summer. So, and then saving the money was not that much money, but it was enough to accomplish, you know, like to carry my backpack and, uh, and then take some, some euros, but not, not many plans. I mean, then you get, you get one visa, you get one boot guide. Uh, and then you decide to go and that's it. You know, it's the most powerful is, is your feeling, you know, and, and your thoughts. Uh, you want to go and you want to do yeah. it. Yeah, but, but I think one of the things that you mentioned that I really resonate with is that you really have to go to a place to know the place. You know what I mean? Especially today with the... I mean, the media is, is a lot about like negative news, right? So whenever you, you, you just try to know a country from like media news and stuff, then you'll be like, oh shit, this country sounds so dangerous. Oh, I'm never going there because, you know, like, like there's so many crimes on the streets and stuff like that. But when you go to a country and really experience it, you suddenly realize that actually this is not the first impression that you have of the country from based off like media and based off the news. When you experience it yourself, when you experience the people, you really form like a, like your own impression. I mean, it could be better or it could be worse, but I would say most of the time, the, the place is way better than I have like envisioned it to be just based off like external influences from everywhere, right? So I think that's kind of important, important as well, which is why you were talking about being able to, to really go to the country and, and even though you might just look through the guidebook and be like wondering like, Hey, shit, I don't even know why I booked this trip, but I guess a lot of the times, I'm not sure if it's true for you when you really get there to the place and you spend a few days, you realize, Hey, this is actually an experience I will never forget or. I will never turn back time and say I wouldn't come here, right? You will still choose to, this is still an experience that's like very close to my heart now that I've met all these people and I've seen these places, I've tried the food and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Normally, when you go to the places, normally they are better than you were expecting or maybe people they were talking about that place in a bad way because sometimes, you know, maybe they, they steal your money or maybe, you know, you get robbed or whatever, but it can happen in your country mm -hmm. also, you know, but people, they are everywhere, you know. It's true that uh, the first impression, you know, it's like you have to, to be there and, and be a little bit uh, waiting, you know, like uh, what's going to happen. But no, normally it's better uh, when you are in the, in the place and, and you, you know, you get the feeling with the people, with the locals, you talk to them and, and it's not so bad. It's like when you watch a movie in, in, in the cinema, you know. Yeah. People, they say, yeah. oh, wow, this is a very good or very bad movie. Then you go there and it was not so good or was not so bad, you know? Yes. But, but yes. it's true. When, when we go to different countries with different culture, it's true that um, normally we are, you know, expecting maybe something, you know? And after a few days, then you give up. You're just like, okay, now no pressure. Now I'm going to travel the country. Now I'm here and just I, I buy the ticket, you know, the local bus. And I try to reach the place I want to visit, you know, and also with the food and everything. You are one more in the country. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I want to go back to uh, what you were saying just now regarding like the bureaucracy of it, because I, I think maybe not many people really recognize the real challenge of traveling to all the countries. I think a lot of people probably think like it's just a matter of like either money or time to be able to go to all the country. But I've heard a bit of your story before because you were sharing it with us. But 
it seems like the biggest issue of getting to all the countries is actually a matter of bureaucracy, right? It's a matter of being able to get the visas to go. And I understand you, you mentioned something about like taking, it really took you the most time for the last few countries. Yes, absolutely. Many people, they, they don't understand finishing all the countries is, is a matter of many things. But uh, it's true that, uh, for example, when you are talking to the people and they realize you have been to every single country in the world, they are asking you, uh, are you going to go to Libya or are you going to go to Afghanistan? So when you say, for example, I've been in, I don't know, in Korea, they understand that you have been in Korea. But when you see you have been in all the countries, it's like they don't realize. For example, you know, in the, in the space, more than 500 people, they have been in the, in the space. Uh, like, uh, and then in, in the, for example, also Everest, you know, maybe 5,000 or 6,000 people, they, they climb Everest. But finishing or visiting all the countries, maybe we are a small family, like 300 or something, something like that. Challenge is huge, you know. And also, I was not thinking about finishing, but when you have less countries, then you say, why not? And also, the, the, the countries that you are living in the least, for example, at the end, mm -hmm. they are countries that they don't allow you to go there, or there is a civil war, or there is a terrorism, or, or there is something going on, but something negative. That's why you, you keep those, those countries the, for, the, for last. the last country. But this, this is the worst thing. Sometimes you have to wait. You, you, you cannot go, you know, because uh, they say right now uh, we don't want uh, like any tourists or other, other countries that they, they want you to pay money. Like you cannot go with economic visa. You need to pay business visa or maybe mm -hmm. invitation letter. So that, that's the problem. It's not, it's not easy and takes time. Another thing, another matter, I have nothing uh, about other travelers that they finish before or later or, or about the age or about the time, like right now with social networks or before without. But it's true that, for example, now it's easier than, than, than before because yeah. of the locals, airlines. Because if you are an influencer or you are someone in, in the social networks, they, they pay you a sponsorship, the hotels, the flights, the insurance, even the visas. And, and, and it's like a marketing, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like a business. Right now, traveling is a, is, is, a, is a business. If you are good, uh, you can make money. Mm -hmm. And also, it's like I, I, I want to finish this, so people they're gonna be they wanna be paying more money. I'm gonna be more famous, so, and then it's, it's a reaction. I mean, then uh, you can sell yourself to the to the companies because you you are everywhere, In many places. You know also how to make money. So yeah, I know people that have been in Antarctica. Antarctica, you know, it's from six thousand to I don't know, let's say twenty thousand US dollar. It's mm -hmm. about the cabin, you know. But the the, yeah. the, the journey is expensive. M many people that they are they go there for for free, you know. So yeah, you know, I, I'm not I'm not complaining, but it's, it's a different way of traveling. Many people are, are traveling very fast, and then they use that to to make money, you know. So that, that's the thing. That's the, the the matter. But but for me, it's important to stay a little bit of time in, in the places because then you, you can feel that you have been there. You, you, you get something from there, a piece of that country with you. The most important thing, I, I think. I agree with you, regard, particularly regarding the period of stay, right? Because when I first started traveling, I was obviously more of like a backpacker that's on a budget because, you know, back then I was just, I was just in university and you're, you're a poor student. So a lot of times the mentality is like, I want to try and cover more places with the limited time and money that I have, you know. So you basically start hopping from one place to another and you're like maybe in a different place almost every other day. But now obviously it's very different for me. I mean, I tend to stay at least a week and in a particular city and I can stay up to like a few months sometime, right? In your opinion, what is like a good timeline to usually spend in a certain place to really understand the culture or be able to understand? get in touch with the people because I think for a lot of tourists it's about going to a place, spend like, I don't know, two to three days and then try and hit all the attractions, all the highlights at the place and then they will just go on to the next place. I mean, I'm not judging anyone's way of traveling. Everyone has like, you know, their preferences like you say, but for you, what do you think is a good period of time that you try to stay in a certain place in order to better understand the culture and stuff like that? Well, no, no, normally to stay in a place to understand the culture and, and get a taste, you should live there. But <laughs> if, you, if, if you don't live there, for example, like the islands, normally what I do is like I rent a motorcycle and I go around the islands to take pictures and to try different places where you can eat. Or also, you know, the main attraction 
places like uh, the beaches or the mountains you have to hike or if you go you know swimming the or uh, snorkeling or whatever it depends about the size of the country about the size of the island but normally an island i don't know it's like uh, maybe one week two weeks it depends about the size and countries for example like the size of china or russia or these big countries you need a lot of time that's why for example i've been in china three times in russia a couple, a couple of times crossing the, the transiberian and and living mm -hmm. a little bit not just doing the transiberian in in three four days i've been doing the transiberian for a month and then i get off catch a, a minibus and i go maybe three four hundred kilometers north or west or east to visit i don't know a castle or a different place but not in the main track it depends about the size. In China also, you China is a huge country. For example, also Australia, you have been three times. But so, sometimes, maybe the country, for example, Namibia or Egypt, you know, it's like not many things to, 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 to see, you know, because it's a desert or maybe in Mongolia the same, you know, like these kind of uh, big areas. That I, I like to study the country and also I like, I like to go to the, the places. I prefer to go to remote places. But of course, you need you need to be in the in the capital, and you need to be uh, maybe sometimes you go to the museums. I, I'm not a like a real museum person, but I like the National History Museum or the the museum from that country to, to see a little bit the the history of of, of the country. Uh, and then I keep maintaining like I want to go to places where I can enjoy more, you know, because when you are in the big cities, everywhere is the same. You have everything. When you go to remote places, you get the, 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 the best, the best taste because you see the, the people, how they are behaving mm -hmm. and how they live. And I think it's, it's very important. So to, to your question is, for example, an island can be one week or two weeks. But I did all the, all the, all the islands in the Pacific Ocean or in the Caribbean, three, four days, one week to maybe two weeks, three weeks. But normally it's from one week, two weeks, the islands and then the countries. Normally what I do, because that, that's another thing. Uh, when they, they give you they issue your, your passport they give you three three months 90 mm -hmm. days so yep. you pay for that so why not <laughs> take it <laughs> you know stay. i don't want to spend the money <laughs> or, or, but i i normally i i stay the that period three months and then maybe i go i, I go out of the country and then i i go into it again i take normally three months yeah it's a, a good time to to be in in the countries and also if you feel bad in one place you, you why you have to stay yeah, longer, yeah, you know. That's true. I mean, that's true. I think I think it's it's good to have flexibility, right? Because yeah. I would say almost all the long term travelers will know that a plan of or itinerary is only as good as like a rough guide, and and most of the time it just changes, right? Like you you could be staying in a place and you're like, oh, actually, I I don't have the vibes for this place. I don't really feel it, and then you decide to move on longer. But there's also time is definitely whereby the people really attract you like for me when i was in Cusco, finished my chupi chup but i was in the hostel that i think i really liked the owners and stuff and and i felt like it was a good place to meet travelers as well that are adventurous because most people go to Cusco, uh not just for Machu Picchu, but also to hike all the other tracks around right so it was a good place to meet people and stuff and i was like a bit tired when when i finished all the track and and the and the itinerary. So I stayed there for like almost a month, which I didn't I didn't really plan it. I think that's the ability to be flexible is actually one of the biggest advantage or joy in being able to travel. And let's let's go to another part that I wanted to talk about because we were talking about bureaucracy, right? But I definitely don't want to discount the difficulty as well in traveling to 195 countries in terms of like the dangers and the risk of it because I know you have some very interesting stories to share about certain places whereby you were you were stuck in the middle of a war or something. So tell us about like one of the one of the most I'll say exciting stories or like one of the most unfortunate stories about you travel to a place and then you're actually stuck there because of some conflict. So I, I try not to go when there is there is a war or where, when there is a there is something going on many countries in in one year uh, let's say for example around the world, around world ticket or, or just one way ticket and and you are doing a, a more countries when i was for example in in afghanistan i entered from a terrorist attack so they they killed 18 uh, united nations soldiers they didn't tell me anything when i was crossing the border i was feeling like something was going on because the police there the militaries were 
where uh, in a bad mood and when not like uh, sneaking my backpack they, normally they they ask you many questions and they they tell you to go to the to the room and and open your backpack and, and check everything but they were like stamping my passport looking at me in a in a sad way and i, I was thinking something is going on here and uh, and then i tried to to pick like taxi no it was second or well, third or uh, fifth hand car like a uh, very old car and i didn't see any 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 people and i saw like tanks i saw like mm. uh, people with 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 guns with, and and i was thinking well is it still the war here or what's going on and then it was because they they were they, they killed the nation soldiers so they were like moving from one place to another for to follow the taliban or whatever and, and i tried to to stop someone to drive me to masar sharif was like 10 kilometers from the border and in my guidebook was like you should pay i don't know 10 us and i was like complaining with that driver and i didn't see any other cars but i was complaining with him like no no you want to rob me I, you, you think i'm a tourist i'm a, i'm a traveler and i want to go there and i don't want to pay more money uh, we can chat the the car and you can take more people but i don't want to pay he was asking me i don't know maybe 20 us and and he's, uh, he was living it and then i was checking around and i said man I, I have to jump in this car and then i will be inside and then i will talk to him but there is nothing else here so i, mm-hmm. I have to go with this man and i have to uh, you know to more or less try to pay less and, and then I, when i was going with him he was driving around and, and i saw that it was like a war so i was like man what, what, what i'm what i'm going what i'm going to do here and then i remember when i arrived to the hotel he told me that uh, i was lucky because uh, no, nobody was was there around and you know should be should be dangerous for me if i stay oh. if i was staying there for a while so when i was in the hotel and also the hotel was like very old hotel and they tried to you know charge me more money and i was a little complaining and i saw the the tv in the tv room and and i saw like terrorists attacking in the screen like people they were dead and and i was thinking that was uh, syria not not wow. not afghanistan no not afghanistan and i was thinking hey well, what's happening here and, and they say yeah uh, three or four hours ago in kabul was a big explosion and, and i say well, kabul here in afghanistan i say no way not possible and then and then i say man i'm, I'm not safe here i have i have to leave this country as, as soon as possible mm-hmm. so i tried to make it to kabul but uh, I, I didn't uh, meet many people but i saw one man like kind of businessman they they were taking out the bombs from many places and they were working for united states or something like that he told me I have a machine and we take out we, we check where the bombs are and then we take the bombs out and whatever and this man told me that he was going to kabul uh, the mm-hmm. next day but because of the terrorist attack so it was not possible at the beginning but uh, he wanted to try and, and i was asking him if it was possible to, to have a lift with him mm. and and he said yes and we were going with him and another, another person it was uh, his cousin and we were going the next morning and we were unlucky because uh, a donkey crossed the road and we crashed the donkey the donkey crashed our car also and we have to stay there. We couldn't move the car, so I was exposed to everyone there, and I was uh, like a little bit, you know, in risk. So I was thinking, now I'm gonna stay with these people, and and I will see, you know, because anything can happen to me. So we tried to take the car again to the same place we were living in Masar Sharif, and we were going to one place like a garage, and then we were searching for the pieces and we were repairing the car for maybe 18 hours. The next day, it was a curfew, so we were in the mountains going to, to Kabul mm-hmm. and it was a tunnel and they said, we have to sleep there, you know. And I was thinking, I don't want to sleep here. It's says, dangerous, you have to stay till the next morning. And we were lucky nothing happened. And the next morning we arrived to Kabul and in Kabul, uh, I was staying there for 10 days, like mm-hmm. hiding in an in a office, in a building from this man. And then I was going around Kabul and a few places. A few days later, I could leave the country. And the same place in uh, Kabul was the airport. Was How many days were you there for in total? Like a couple of weeks, two weeks. You were a couple of weeks and you, you basically didn't do anything traveling, right? You were basically trying to escape the country for two weeks because the moment you got in, it was like the start of the conflict. And then you were just trying to navigate your way to the airport to get out. When I was in Masar Sharif, to get to Kabul, you have to cross all the country. So I was going, I don't know how many kilometers all the way. And we were stopping for having dinner, uh, lunch, but we were still a few places. 
And then in, in Kabul, I, I was going out with a friend uh, of this guy. He was taking care of me. And I was like not talking and following him. And uh, I could go to the Masood Castle because he's on top of Kabul. And also mm-hmm. I, I went to a few suburbs. But the, the main point to be in Afghanistan was going to see the Bamiyan area and also other, other places, you know, you are not safe. You cannot stay there. Anything can happen to you, you know. So it's, it's better to leave and, and go another time. Well, I, I think one thing that you mentioned, it's very interesting, particularly in your case, right? Because I mean, I've been in certain conflicts in some countries as well, but obviously not as drastic as what you have been through. Mine was more like just protests and stuff like that, you know. You get tear gas by the because you're stuck within the crowd, and then you get tear gas by the legal enforcement and stuff like that. But there is this thing you were saying about talking to people there, and basically, you really trust to the people you're traveling with, right? And and they are kind of like strangers. You just met them, and you decided that hey, I'm just going to go with you, right? And while traveling, we do meet people that are like good-hearted and stuff. But we also definitely do sometimes come across people that are, you know, trying to scam you and stuff like that. So in situations like that, how do you know or how do you gauge who to trust and who to take a precaution against and stuff? Well, no, normally for me, for what's working for me, it's my view. I mean, I have something in my brain, like I can notice that I can, can be there. And maybe if I see something that is not working... Then I try to go or to or try to do something. For example, I've been a few times with uh, taxi drivers mm-hmm. and uh, they are asking many questions or, or maybe it's uh, not the best time to be there, you know, in the airport, uh, 4 a.m. in the morning, nobody. And then if these guys, I don't know, tries to get you, if you are not sure, just stay there if you, you have more people and sleep in the airport, whatever. But sometimes I, I've been like going with people because, I, I don't know, I was thinking... I can trust this man. I, I see something in, in his eyes. He's a trustful person. But if, if I see that it's not so so obvious, then I, I prefer to stop. I pay the money and I take another transport. In Mexico, I remember, they say, you want the big right or the small right? You are new there. <laughs> what means? You know? And it, yeah, because it's like a scam. They want to get more money. Or, or sometimes, you know, I try always to take the, the bus to yeah. the airport. Yeah, but because it's, it's cheaper. But sometimes you have no buses. Mm-hmm. But with the people, it's the same. Uh, if they are asking many questions, if uh, you don't feel comfortable, just move, just, just go, you know? It's like, don't, don't stay there for forever or do another thing or try to find another way. What are other precautions that you generally take while you are traveling? Because I know you, you travel alone a lot, which makes sense because it's very hard to find people that have time to go if you're over the place and like you know not everyone is that committed to say traveling and stuff like that i I mean it's just that we have to go it's like itchy backside right you have to wander last and it's a priority for most travelers like we see it as something that as part of us but since you're always traveling alone and i think i've seen quite a few people who are concerned about traveling alone because they have never done it themselves and for me it's not as it was never really a big question, I would say, because when I first started traveling, it was already kind of alone. So I just fell into it naturally. But traveling for so long, I do see some disadvantages of traveling alone. Whereby, you know, like I want to go to the toilet and have my whole big backpack. But then I was like, shit, no one's here to take care of my backpack. So I have to carry the whole backpack into like the toilet cubicle or stuff like that. And sometimes you're like just squeezing around. What are some precautions that you usually take when you're traveling alone? Uh, I carry the money in the money belts. I try always to have it with me, the, the money bell. Sometimes you, you leave everything, you belong in the safety box, in the room. But sometimes they also they, they can break it and then get the money or whatever. I try to always to carry with me the money. Normally, you, you don't take a lot of money, cash with you when maybe you have a plastic money like credit cards or debit cards. Many years ago, when I was traveling with a lot of cash, it was more difficult because sometimes you, you go to the beach, what are you going to do, you know? <laughs> And there are plenty of people, if you are in Rio de Janeiro, for sure, you know, you, you, you're mm. going to have a problem, you know, they're going to steal, they're going to rob you because they work in with more people. If I know someone, I, I ask <laughs> him to, to take care of my belongings, you know, but it's true that it's, it's a handicap because you have your money and you don't want uh, the money to be robbed. Yeah. On, on this point, I have to interrupt you because like, I, I have a interesting story to share myself on this part, just because you are talking about deciding somewhat like so i basically got my room broken into in peru and it was 
it was quite bad just because I left to go to the gym, which is like, I mean, I'm going to the gym, so I'm obviously not carrying my stuff or anything. So I only brought my handphone and like uh, local cash. So basically Peruvian soles and that's all I took, right? And then everything else was in the room and then it got broken into. So the guy basically took all my electronics so my laptops and stuff and also my foreign currency, which I left in the room. And then subsequently for like, I would say for the next five to six months, I always had trouble deciding whether I should keep my stuff in the room, which maybe have a locker, or should I just bring it out with me? Because I was like, sometimes I'm going out on the streets at night and I don't really want to be carrying like all my passport and a whole chunk of money, right? It doesn't make sense because you get robbed and then you're like, shit. But if you leave it in the room, and someone breaks in, it's kind of like if you get robbed, you can almost have at least an opportunity of deciding what you want to give up, right? Like I can say, okay, I'll give up my cash, but I'll try to hide my handphone or something like that, you know? Or I'll try to keep my passport. But whereas if you keep it in the room and someone breaks in, you have no control over what they take. They're just going to take whatever they want, right? So for the next five to six months, I got to be paranoid every time I go to a place on my shit. So now that I'm going out, should I take things or should I leave it in the room? So I was like, ah, this is kind of troublesome, right? And the same for Brazil, particularly you're talking about, especially in Rio. And, and I mean, I was walking on the street one night with Cyrus. Cyrus is a common friend for both of us. And, and we literally saw like a snatch tap happening. So, so the lady was using the phone on the street and then someone just cycled past, snatched the phone and just, just cycled off pretty dangerous and when i went into brazil i had the plan of basically so i carried a dummy phone that i got from punta the estate in paraguay which is where you get all the cheap electronics so i just got like a kind of a dummy phone to use in in real you know i've heard like bad stories about it like almost everyone has been robbed so i'm like okay shit i guess like a common experience that most of us have in getting robbed somewhere somehow that, that's the price we have to pay for traveling my friend Everybody has the same situation. It's up to you what you decide. But I also have the same feeling. I completely understand you. And I think everybody has the same story, you know, because it's true that we are living with that. We cannot be safe, you know. I mean, you have to trust people and people that have yeah. to trust you. And sometimes you hide, you hide the money under your pillow. Sometimes <laughs> you take it to, to the bathroom with you. My, my advice is try to, to have it with you if it's possible. But of course, if you are gonna go out with all your money and your passport, that's not the best option. You have to, to hide the money or you need a safety box, you know? Yeah. But uh, in the locker also, they, they brought me in Peru, in, in the hostel, I stayed two months mm -hmm. and the cleaner was asking me, oh, you, are you working here? Are you staying here? And, and I was thinking, when, when I was robbed, I was thinking this woman, you know, she knows how to, to break this, the locker and, and get the mm. money because they were taking like bank notes, little bank notes. So that, that's the point. The locker was, was locked, but she could handle from, from the bottom one that was empty to do something because it was a, a piece of wood and was a little bit moving that piece of wood. So I don't know, but you, you don't think uh, when you leave your money in a locker, that that's why you leave it there. <laughs> you, you think it's safe. But then I, I got an argument with, uh, with the boss. He told me you, you cannot say it was cleaner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and maybe where the, the other guys so, and then uh, you know it's, it's a matter of who is right you know but, but for my my it was it was basically a local traveler so a peruvian that checked in that day kind of knew it was him because he checked in that day and then after that he just left without anything he didn't come back for the night despite booking for the night right so we we're like okay then this is like a dodgy fellow and then they were like okay it has to be this guy that took it but, but i will say what was interesting was really that because he booked a hostel dorm bed, right? And I think his intention was actually to rob the lockers because it's kind of funny because you will know that a locker usually has valuables because that is what's a lock, what a locker is meant for, right? People usually, like tourists, they go out, they'll put the valuables in the locker. So when you rob a locker, there's a good chance you get valuable stuff. Right. But I was in a private room because I was staying there for quite a while. So I, I booked a private room. And the reason, or they suspected the reason that he went to rob the private room rather than the locker was because there was another girl happened to be just sleeping in the dorm room that day and didn't go out. So he couldn't rob the lockers. So instead he decided to go to the other block to try, try to rob the private rooms. So it's kind of interesting whereby 
sometimes maybe the dorm rooms where more people going in and out is safer than having like a isolated room whereby you know if you you are leaving it then no one is there I had the same the same thing you know like they, they go they stay overnight go out for party or or whatever the the person the local or another can be another traveler also they they go there to sleep one night and and they take uh, all, all your money you know from the locker like for example a few years ago people in the same dorm we were going or having a beer or was okay right now any person that even if you go out and have, you have a beer can, can be the, the man who's going to take your your money you know times are changing i don't know why but before people were more I don't know, more, more legal for me i don't know that's what what i think it's it's just very interesting on how travel has changed over the years i think mainly because of technology and media exposure everywhere i mean in the past maybe a bit harder to travel because you have to make use of guide books and maps and everything and today you have mobile phones but in the past maybe you were saying okay let's say we go to a more developing country or more remote place whereby people are not as exposed to media or international influence right you kind of feel like people are more genuine and they have a local vibe that you feel but because today a lot of places are starting to get exposed to international news and global influence tourism is obviously a big space so it starts getting a bit commercial for sure and of course when it starts getting commercial so there are people who try and come out because there are more tourists to the place so the scammers that are in the city or in the country also comes out you know and, and they start to try and do all kind of creative things and i mean this is not just for developing countries but very popular travel destinations like rome or in western europe there is also that that risk of having like crime syndicates that are professional and like pickpocketing and stuff like that so so i think that is maybe it could also be that it has always been happening it's just that we don't know but now with social media and stuff like that it's way more obvious like whenever someone experiences this they will post it online and then you know you, you just know it right i guess it's a big change and i i also wanted to talk to you about like we were on, on this particular topic we are basically saying that to travel is almost to be vulnerable right you are you can't always be in your own bubble at some point of time you need to trust someone you need to open up yourself to strangers and that is how you experience the world but obviously that also puts you at risk but i always say that traveling is probably especially solo traveling is a very self discovery process right like you learn a lot about yourself when you start traveling alone and you have time to see how you yourself react to circumstances or challenges along the way so you have been traveling for like almost 30 years and i know definitely time and age changes your perspective but how did travel change your perspective or how do you see the world differently now that you have been to so many countries and experienced so many different and exciting things when i when i was starting traveling like when i was 23 years old was very very different than, than than right now and i was younger and i was plenty of energy and i was like watching a world map and i say i want to go from this point to the other point and and then i was thinking okay i, I need the passport i need uh, to get a little bit of money i was not bad in, in english french so i was thinking okay I, i'm going to try to do it i was not scared but i was a little bit always thinking what i want to meet there what i want to find or, or what's what's going on you know what will happen with the place i'm going to visit because i'm i don't know anything but i was a little bit curious but once you start it's like you don't want to go back because you, you know that if in your country you are safe and you want to discover so it's like for example when you go somewhere it's another culture is is a, a different country they speak a different language so you're a little bit like discovering yourself and also mm -hmm. you're challenging yourself and after that you you want to to try to to find uh, the right place to stay for a while but always it, you know you have to to maintain your itinerary you know like at your goal you never leave your goal behind i mean like when you're young you you want to tweet the world you want to see every every single thing and you want to to finish to uh, to get the, your goal and after that you you discover that it's a very rich thing to do because you are speaking different language you are meeting different people 
you, you want to keep going doing that for the rest of your life. That's the, the feeling at the beginning. You want to earn more money and you want to, again, go and travel. It's always the same. And then you, you're having more experience and then you cannot stop. It's like addiction. It's like when you are older, then you, you go, you slow down and it takes everything. It's like you, you want to see uh, the places in another time. I mean, you want to, to have more taste of that. When you're young, you are, you are crazy. Now, now, now I'm 51. When I started, maybe I was 23. Uh -huh. So yeah, pay, I pay the price. And, and, I, and now it's <laughs> like I have less years to live. So I want to stay longer in the places and, and sharing more, more moments than, than before. I, I agree totally on this point that it's a combination of factors. Like one is, of course, when I mentioned just now, when I was a backpacker, the budget is one of the reasons but also because you are energetic, like you can just go crazy and, and you don't feel it as much. Because I used to just take overnight buses because it's a good way to save, firstly, to save money because you're not spending your money on the hostel. You're basically taking an overnight bus, which you need to take anyway. And it's also, it saves time because then you wake up and then you can go and explore and then you take another overnight bus. So, so I had like, I tried taking like three, almost three overnight buses without showering. And then when I got to the hostel in, in Merida in Mexico, I was, I was smelling like really bad. The, the hostel owner was like looking like this guy looks like he's homeless or some shit. I'm like, no, no, no. I, I just didn't shower for like three days straight. And that's something that I definitely try not to do these days because no longer makes as much sense for me now. I guess it's true that. The other issue is that once you have been to a lot of places, I personally find myself not as interested in sites or places of attraction, but more interested in the people and the culture. I think one of the things is that, for example, in nature, I was always saying that uh, there's only that many waterfalls that you can see until you you kind of get like oh okay it's another waterfall because like like i remember the first time i see a waterfall obviously it was like freaking amazing because i don't have like big waterfalls in my country so the first time i saw it i was like oh this is crazy but then after traveling so long i've been to like niagara falls i've been to iguazu falls and so you sometimes you see a stream of water going down and you're just like okay it's I mean, it's nice, but it's just another waterfall, right? That for me is a bit of maybe like the downside of going around too much. But do you feel the same whereby you are also more tied down to wanting to experience because you, you have finished your goal already? So I think you probably have a very different objective about traveling these days. Well, what are you looking to do these days when you're traveling? What are you hunting for? Well, right now, what I'm doing is going to the countries I've been, but the areas, maybe, I, you know, I was missing uh, some areas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so then uh, what I'm doing is I try to, to go to that, those areas uh, in, in those countries or maybe visiting people. I stay longer. And then also it's, it's true that, for example, when, when you go to an island, you know, an island is like palm trees, the ocean and uh, the market and the church with people, but in, in all the islands, it's, it's going to be the same, you know, with different name of the country, but it's mm -hmm. going to be like they say, different day, same shit. It's true that you, you see more or less when you see, for example, uh, in Africa, many countries are, are the same and you are white and you have problems because they want your money. You, you think it's, it's always the, the same kind of countries. It's different when, when you go to countries with nature because you are more you see something different. It's not like the, the countries that more or less are the same. Of course, we are measuring also the places we go because of the UNESCO uh, mm -hmm. or maybe because the touristic points, you know, that we have to visit because if you are there, is is the, the main thing to do. Like you said, I, I enjoy more with people, mm. with the people in, in, the, in the places more than, than the place, you know, in himself, you know. I have the same point of view like, like you. I agree because it's, it's true that uh, the, here we say, if you have seen one island, you have seen all of them. How do you say it in Spanish? Be, 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 vista una isla, vistas todas. But then maybe the islands are the islands, but then what's in the island, the, the people is, is different, you know? That's the thing that you, you, you go and you have a different experience because of the people, not because of the, of the place. I, I also believe one thing about traveling and why the people matter so much is that there is a group of travelers that only like to hang out with locals and they don't hang out with tourists because they feel like, you know, 
why would I come to a place and hang out with international travelers? But of course, there's also another group of people that only hang out with international travelers because it's easy to communicate and they don't really push the locals because sometimes it might be weird. But I kind of feel like you actually get very different stories from both of these groups of people because for locals, you usually hear like, their local story and you kind of know the culture and and the pride especially in many places you feel their pride for the look for their country or for their state you know and that's very different on the other hand travelers give a story about i'll say why they are traveling i think that's very interesting because a lot of people are traveling for, okay of course i know that there are some people traveling just for the sake of like a holiday but when you speak to more, I'll say long-term travelers, they usually have like a story behind it on like, sometimes it could be spiritual, sometimes it could be trying to recover from some memories or, or wounds that they suffered. And they kind of challenges your mentality or they challenge their stories, their perspective, challenge your view of the world. You know, because I'll say one of the biggest thing about traveling is that you realize how small you are in the whole scheme of things and how anything that you kind of assume is the norm is actually not the norm like different people really have very different perspective of things which they think is the norm what i see is like many old travelers they know like these kind of paradises you know like for example india in goa in, in indonesia the tojan islands then thailand you know, that was for many years that they picked these kind of places just to, to escape the winter of, of the, their countries. So, but also because they have been going there for a long time, you know, in the Philippines also, in Palawan Island. They these kind of sanctuaries, you know, that people, they go there, they stay with locals and they exchange. Some, some are wood, some are not. For me, you know, when I travel, for example, at the beginning, uh, I was thinking, why, why I'm traveling? My, my parents, they, they get divorced. Maybe I was not, you know, very stable at that moment. And I, I was escaping, you know, from, from uh, the situation in my family. What they say when I'm, when I'm meeting a lot of people, because I'm, I'm long time in the road, uh, I would say the same, you know, like the wall is like a hospital and it's plenty of sick people all around, you know. They, they are escaping from something, you know. I, I know also you have been meeting a, a lot of different people. And it's like we are escaping from something. But it's crazy because sometimes we, we can talk to someone, you, you, you think you trust that person and you can talk to him and, and maybe explain your, your life, you know, like you're talking about problems back home or, or maybe a few things, you know, it's like a, a psychologist, you know, that, that's why, for example, in, in, in United States, uh, many years ago, uh, I was talking to someone and, and I said, yeah, because here in, in United States, you have the psychologist, but in, in my country, if you say you, you go to the psychologist, it's like you are you are mad. You are a mad person. Yeah. So what, what we do when we are traveling, we take all the shit, you know, out. And uh, and that's why when we come back to, uh, to our home, that we feel better because trusting someone and, and we are we were using that person as a psychologist. That's why. And also because of, uh, of, of the moments, experience you have been through mm -hmm. uh, traveling with the people, the place and it's everything is new. So. It's like, wow, uh, I want more of this. But, but it's true that many people are, are doing a different life. When uh, there's something bad going, something is going bad, then, then they try to, to use the, the, the travel, you know, the safari. So they, they use the, the travel to, to escape from the situation. And then they are like in a bubble. And, and they think that they believe that it's going to be better because they left the, the bad situation or the problem, you know, back home. And that's why... People, they, are, they, they go and they stay in, in many places and they try to restart, to, to have a new life. Or at least, uh, you know, the moment you are escaping and try to think about what's going to be your next move to, or where are you going to live? Because I met many, many different stories about people selling the house or everything. or They, they were like, they, they don't have anything else themselves. A little bit of money and just just escaping the, the situation. So it's true that um, many, many times you, you are... Uh, through these kind of people, you know? Yeah, I, I think this is a very tricky, like my point of view on this is it's a bit of a very tricky situation whereby I do recognize that some people are really, for example, they are stressed with life and stuff like that and they go on a trip and it, it really helps. Some of them go on trips and then they, they manage to recover and to get a break from everything and they go back and they are refreshed, right? It's almost like a person going for vacation or they really experience something and it changes their mindset about 
about how the world actually functions or they realize that hey maybe my problems are not as big as people who are who can't even get food and stuff like that right but there's also the other dangerous side which which is saying that travels become traveling becomes like an escape from a normal life or or your daily problems which will continue to exist even after you go back there was just a casual discussion with one of my travel buddies uh, before that traveling is almost like a cop out in the sense that you were almost well i've not, never heard anyone say that hey i went to travel and i regretted it like almost traveling is a guarantee that the time will be well spent in, in the sense that you know you will not regret the time you go traveling but the problem is then that it might be a false illusion your usual problems which will continue to be there when you go back home right so I, I guess that is like a bit of a a bit of a tricky situation there but again everyone has their own problems they have their own point of view and stuff like that and and I'll say give it a shot and see how it goes right like it's really not up to third parties to judge or anything like that it's it's just a very interesting phenomenon <laughs> let's just call it that way to see happening okay let's talk about about which is your favorite country so far out of all the countries that you have been to I, I was in antarctica and i think it was the, the place that i was more stoned you know normally we're talking about uh, countries you have to choose one was papua papua new guinea papua new guinea uh -huh, uh -huh. In, uh, in the pacific ocean yep i choose like two countries per, per continent in Europe, where they were Spain because I'm from Spain and I like it here, the gastronomy. And then also I pick Iceland because mm -hmm. Iceland also is nature and it's, it's an amazing place. That, that's in Europe, in Asia. I pick like Yemen, because it's, it's, it's an amazing country also. Mm -hmm. and, and the island of Socotra is Paris paradise for me. It's one of the best places. The beach there is amazing. India, okay, the country Ooh. that you, you are learning in the school of life, you can hate it or you can love it. India is 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 amazing, and, you know the experience and the shock you have when you are there and you see that that people or traveling by train is a very very, very top experiences. Uh, New Zealand and uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, I said, and then in in America, big like Alaska and uh, and Brazil, for example, because of the Amazon River and uh, I, uh, Brazil is also a huge country uh, to explore and discover and. And as Richard also and in Fernando de Naroña, the island, it's also a very good place to, to go. So yeah, that, that's more or less the, the countries. But you have to pick one instead of Antarctica, should be Papua New Guinea. People there, they are still barefoot to catch the planes. And you, you meet some this kind of, from the bird of paradise, you, maybe there are like 20 bird of paradise, this kind of birds with colors and long tail. You know, it's, it's, a, yep. it's a very famous uh, bird and very nice. So from 20 species they have there, maybe they have 18 uh, giant clams, shipwrecks, you can go diving. And, and the country is, is so virgin. And also maybe you put your, your feet and to, to places that never have been there before, your, your mark. And, and you can also go and, and explore and, and find new species of trees or insects or animals that they don't know that they exist and you, you can put your name on it you know because many yeah. biologists and many uh, scientists they go there and, and they they go to find new species so mm -hmm. you can go there and, and you can label one of those uh, animals or species and, and put your your name on it if you if you are the first person who find the this animal or insect yeah it sounds like there's a lot of biodiversity and a lot of wildlife there that's still quite untouched which is kind of rare these days right because i mean tourists are going everywhere and all the in some sense the natural landscapes are all changing partly because of human presence but it's yeah. still very rare to find places that are that are still very you know raw and pristine one of the best tracks that i've done these days uh in the last few years was also and, and I think you were we were talking on the cruise uh, to Antarctica, whereby you were pointing out that Puerto Williams is basically the the southernmost uh, city nowadays compared to Ushuaia. And then after that, after Antarctica, we went to do the trek at uh, Dientes de Navarino, um, and that was that was quite rare because I think it was very challenging because the weather was really bad when we did it and then we came back like limping and stuff like that with a lot of blisters <laughs> on our feet but i'll say that that nature was probably 
almost like the most untouched I've seen because most of the heights or the popular heights in Patagonia, they are well marked. And even in Torres del Paine, they are like proper toilets and stuff for you to use. But oh, the one we did at the Dientes was just like, <laughs> you're just like plugging in your tent everywhere and then just trying to find water and stuff like that. So, so I think like nature, being able to find like untouched nature is, is getting harder and harder. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. And I would say one of the things that really changed the way a particular country feels to you, or at least feels to me, is really the people that I meet there and the people that maybe I'm traveling with, right? Because it changes a lot of the experience, I find. I mean, we were in Antarctica together and I was saying, always saying that one of the main things that made the trip that memorable was because like the group of us was so close to each other because there's only like a limited number of say international travelers right the rest were almost tour groups so do you feel the same whereby sometimes it's not the place but the people you are with that changes your perception of the place i totally agree people is the must you, you go to the places not because of the place you think is the place but then when you're there you discover you know the for example, in, in Afghanistan or Syria, you mm -hmm. think they are all terrorists. But for me, it was hospitable people. They were helping yeah. me. Per Persian people, they are amazing. It's not, for example, in Muslims, they give you three days uh, of food and three days of accommodation because of uh, the, the holy book, the Quran. They, they say they have to do this, you know. But maybe when you mm -hmm. go from, from that place, they, they, they say, hey, we are nice people. Why you don't, you don't want to be a Muslim, you know, for example? But the Persian, uh, they say, okay, you know, in Iran or Afghanistan, they, they, they say, okay, you, you can stay here. And they don't say, hey, you have to leave tomorrow. It's like, and they do it properly. I mean, you, you feel that uh, the way they are doing things is because they feel it. They, they, yeah. they want to be, you know, the hospitality is, is amazing. So it's true that in certain countries, people, maybe you hear also that, for example, Iran is, is an amazing country. The, the people are amazing. Maybe not the government, you know, but uh, the people uh -huh. is, is amazing. And also, for example, Saudi Arabia, if you go there, for example, it's no freedom and they, they don't have rights, the people. I mean, you, you have to go there and you have to be careful what you do, where you go, with who you talk. So, and by the other side, if you go to, for example, I don't know, countries in, in Europe, it's a little bit different. But mm -hmm. in, in Asia, people, they, they just go with you, they help you. And uh, they, they make the, the journey better because uh, if the people are, are nice, then you want to stay longer. It's more about the people than the country because, okay, countries are countries, uh, concrete jungles are concrete jungles, you know, nature is nature, and you're going to be okay also in the nature. But yeah, the problem is when you go to those places that they are overcrowded, you know, like uh, cities, because in Africa, oh, the big cities, for example, are plenty of thieves because the, the, the those children, they are, for example, in uh, in the areas. They have nothing to eat, nothing to work, so they they go to the to the big city to get something. And then when you you start like like robbing and all the stuff, when when you get the money and it's easy, then you don't want to work. You know, I mean that, that's why they they are in the big city. Always you have problems, but this is like a universal. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean like because they, I was robbing. I don't know. In Morocco, Morocco is a bad country. It can happen also. It happened to me in, in my country also. But it's, okay. it's about, about people is very important. I mean, it's, it's the, the main key for, for you for feeling okay when you when you are traveling. The country, yeah, you have to go to the sightseeing and the, the stuff. But then the people they make it more and more attractive to to stay. Also, sometimes you you feel safe or you feel better. I think there's. I also experienced quite a bit of hospitality in the Middle East, and and this is what I was saying like. Until you, well, I mean, the sad, the sad thing about today's media or like a lot of international media is that people are branding, you know, certain groups of people as dangerous or whatever. And it's not definitely not like a universal truth for sure. And it's only when you go to a certain place and you really see the different sides of it that you really get a better idea or you, you really are able to pass your own judgment about it or your impression of it rather than just relying on whatever is, you know, being said online and stuff like that so I, I thought that was important as well now that well covid is obviously the big thing these days uh and it has affected the travel industry a lot what do you foresee is the travel the future of travel 
just based on you know the current situation well i think people they, they're gonna travel i mean the only thing we need right now is the vaccination but people they, they are not going to change the, the you know the, the mentality because of you know they will carry a mask but it's true we are going to change the, the habits i mean with, with the restrictions and also at the beginning is going to be a little bit hard because we will maintain the distance between one person and another about touching things Whatever, but at the end will be okay. But we have to to handle, you know. Like have, we have to use to. Uh, right now, it's it's like a little bit. You think it's not going to be possible, and also I think they're going to increase the, the the prices because the the planes they are going to go with maybe less capacity, less planes. That means uh, the tickets must be more expensive, and also I, I think many companies maybe they are going to close. People they don't want to change. I mean, people we are. Homo sapiens, you know, we were hunting and, and, and moving always in, the, in our civilization. So we are always going from one place to another. And curiosity, we have to do things because we want to explore and, and go to, to places to, to understand how people they live there. I, I believe that uh, we're going to change a little bit the way we are traveling, but people, they, you cannot stop people traveling. That, that's impossible because it's the only thing you pay and you are getting rich because you get something, you know. Real, there's this quote saying something like, "Traveling is traveling is the only thing that you can buy that really makes you rich, right? Because it's it's a spiritual fulfillment, something like that." Yeah, my my concern is also that travel might start to get expensive. One of the main reasons is also that a lot of budget airlines are cutting down some of their routes. I know in the past few years, but what one of the reasons that travel got some so prominent in the last decade or last five years is also because of budget airlines right because there's no budget airlines people find it cheaper and easier to travel but for example norwegian which is i wouldn't really say their budget or not but they are one of the the flights that are running like cheaper rates from for example europe to south america and stuff but i know i know they are not doing very well now because i think the government is not willing to so-called build them out of their expenses or their debt so i know they are They'll probably be cutting a lot of routes from, like, let's say, South America to Europe is obviously probably not going to be a priority for them, right? They will still focus on inter, like, within Europe, because that is still where their base or their foundation started. So I think there will be less flight routes, and because of that, prices are going to increase. And of course, you're also talking about like the capacity of airlines and maybe even hotels will start to be like changing and because of that the demand and supply my, uh, will probably cause prices to change yeah I, I guess the vaccination is is almost what everyone is looking at in recent in the recent months because it could likely be that everyone will need vaccination to travel or something like that it's like yellow fever whereby some countries require your yellow fever vaccination booklet to enter certain countries or certain places yeah so that's kind of also how i foresee or probably go so to, to close it out, I guess we will have the most cliche question, but probably everyone will want to hear about it, is that what is the one important tip that you will give to everyone who is traveling? Well, there, there is a saying, you know, if you want to travel far, travel alone and, and travel light. You have to carry all, the, all your stuff with you. So mm -hmm. normally you, you, what you can do is you can buy things when you you arrive to the country i assume that in the markets you know you, you can buy stuff but also it's very important that the weight because you're going to carry your backpack for for a long journey so it's very important what you want to use maybe if, if you need i don't know two t-shirts don't carry four like shoes or whatever you know or sleeping bag you need to know you need to focus uh, what you need because when i was young the, the main uh, problem was i was carrying a lot of weight then you mm -hmm. learn you're traveling with two, three or four kilos, but at the beginning you were traveling with maybe, I don't know, uh, 10, 12 kilos or maybe even, even more sometimes, you know. You were going to the sports shop and you were carrying like a torch, you were carrying a, a watch, you were carrying a, a sleeping bag, a tent, you were carrying a lot of things. And after three months you say, I, I didn't pitch the tent, so why I'm carrying <laughs> three or four extra kilos in my bag, you know. Yes. And then... You, and then when, when you are like uh, going to, to places, when you go like uh, hiking, if you ha have to for a few days and you have to, to carry all the stuff with you, then you are suffering and say, well, uh, why, why I was carrying all the, 
that things, you know, I'm not using. The main thing is to know uh, where you go, uh, what you want to do. And also, of course, if the weather is changing or maybe you're going to a place that is going to be raining or, or cold weather, then you need uh, yeah, to take some, some you know, like a jacket. Or, but you have, to be, you have to use one thing of everything. That, like, like uh, don't take two, two jackets, don't, don't take two, two shoes, you know. Always be very strict where you are carrying because it's, 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 you're going to suffer a lot if you are going to go for a, a long journey. And, and then also you have to organize a little bit your, all your documents. They have to be in a, in a file in your email or in the computer or in the in, in the cell phone you know in a in a place that you can in case you you lose it you can you can get it easy because another another thing that happened to me when uh, maybe when when you lose when you lose that the passport if you don't have anything else then uh, the embassy has to you know to call back to spain and, and it's going to take for a while so but if you have already a copy they can see your the, the number of the passport and and it's going to be easier so and also before we were traveling with uh, travel checks you were losing the, the travel checks that you could get the uh, reimbursed, you can get the money back. But right now, with a phone, you can do almost everything. You don't need anything else. So if you are asking me which thing you will take, you know, the most important thing, uh, right now sh should be the the, 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 the cell phone, you know? Yeah. yeah, the cell phone, because also it's a camera. Normally I would say a camera, photo camera, but now also the cameras, if you have a photo camera, yeah. a very big one with, with, with the zooms and all the stuff, then uh, it's also a way, you know, and also they can they can steal your camera and also the the, the thieves they can follow you because they, they saw that you have a, a big lens, whatever. So now the phone is is the main thing for because it's, it's an alarm, is a torch, is a is a phone. Uh, you have the whole universe in, in the in the cell phone. So mm -hmm. uh, be be sure that you don't you don't miss uh, you you don't leave your cell phone back home, you know. For sure, I don't I don't think anyone will forget their phone these days. I mean, people are taking their phones to everywhere, even in the toilet, for sure. So that's, that's, but that's like, I guess how technology has really changed traveling in the sense that now everything is way more compact. I mean, things like travelers checks and, and like all the old school cameras are, are like things that probably the younger generations might not even have heard of. They're like, what the, what the hell is a traveler's check? Yeah. It's, it's so funny these days. So, so basically, your advice is to travel light and to basically back up your important documents somewhere, somehow using all the technology platforms available today. Yep, yep. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you for coming on today, Carlos. I think like the stories that you share and the travel insights that you share are pretty interesting to, to the listeners. Um, so thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you to you also, Rax. All the best and keep traveling. We will yeah. survive the, the pandemic, no problem, man. We will keep traveling, you will see. Yeah, for sure, for sure. We will keep in touch. Yep. Yeah. Chat, to, chat with you. you soon. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thank you for listening to Chat with Nomads. Please remember to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And be sure to share with your friends. Also, we'd love to know what topics you'd like to hear more about. To stay updated on the latest, join us on our mailing list at chatwithnomads.com. You can also find more travel and nomading tips at Nomads Unveiled. That's N-O-M-A-D-S-U-N-V-E-I-L-E-D.com. Start living your dreams today. We'll catch you in the next episode.